Hey everyone, we talk a lot about classic TBC tips and tricks on this channel, small bits of information that provide you with a lot of value and can sometimes save you a lot of time while playing. The thing is that we often talk about these tips along with other content, and they're very easy to miss as a viewer. So today, I wanted to consolidate all these small tips and tricks in one big video. This video will contain a lot of things that we already talked about in the past, but also a lot of new tips that we never mentioned on this channel. The goal here is to provide you with a ton of value in as little time as possible. So with that said, sit back, relax, and let's learn about 30 classic TBC tips and tricks together. To start with, let's talk about meta gems. Meta gems are a special type of gem in TBC that go on your helmet and have a special requirement that must be met for the gem's bonus to be activated. For example, in order to enable the Relentless Earthstone Diamond gem, you must socket at least two yellow gems and one red gem on your gear. You'll find that meeting those requirements can be tricky at times, so to make this more simple, you can use mixed colored gems. Green gems can act as both a a blue and a green gem. Purple gems act as both red and blue gems, and orange gems as red or yellow gems. Those mixed color gems usually have reduced stats, but you often find that using them is still beneficial to meet the meta gem requirement and not lose the socket bonus on your gear. Speaking of socket bonus, let's talk about that. Gear that comes with sockets often gives you more stats if you socket it with the correct type of gem to meet the bonus's requirement. For this reason, try to match the colors on the sockets as much as possible, or use the mixed colored gems that we talked about earlier. Keep in mind, however, that for a lot of classes, respecting those socket bonuses is not worth it. Tanks usually want to always gem for stamina no matter what, and melee DPS or hunters want to reach their 9% hit cap first and then worry about other stats. Guild banks are a new addition to TBC. They are currently not enabled on the beta, so the assumption is that they won't be active at launch for a phase or two. Those will not only make your guild's life easier to sort items, but they are also very useful for individual players, as guild bank tabs offer you a whopping 98 item slots for just 100 gold, at least for the first tab. This is a great value as far as inventory space goes, and you should make a personal guild just for that. Speaking of inventory space, remember to make yourself a bank alt, especially while leveling. This will come in handy just to drop all the items that you don't know the usefulness for yet. You can mail an infinite amount of items, and your bank alt's mailbox will hold them for 30 days before automatically returning them to your main character, so you can essentially have infinite backspace with this trick. Your arena team rating is tied to how many matches you win or lose. The more you lose, the lower your rating becomes, and the less arena points you get at the end of every week. To avoid letting your arena rating go down to oblivion, if you're bad at PvP like I am, one trick is to delete your arena team and then create a new one. Your rating will then be reset to 1500. You can get past any locked doors by using this small trick. First, get yourself killed near the locked door that you want to go through. Then, get back there on ghost form and log off right near the door. Once you log back in, keep your W key pressed and your character will now get through the door. This trick can be very useful early on if you don't have the key to Shattered Holes or Shadow Labyrinth. This doesn't work with Architraz or Karazhan, unfortunately, because the former resurrects you at the bottom and the latter actually requires you to have the key to zone into the rate, at least early on in the expansion. Here's a trick that only works right now before the pre-patch drops. If you want to get, for example, a Night Saber as a human or a Kodo as an orc, and you're not exalted with that race to be able to buy the mount, you can make a character from that race, mail yourself the 900 gold required to buy the mount, buy the mount on the character that can buy it, then mail the mount to the character that you want to use it on. Once the pre-patch for TBC drops, you'll be able to ride that mount, and you just skip the need to be exalted to buy it. This only only works if you start it in classic right now though, so do it now while you can. Speaking of mounts, in Burning Crusade, you can buy your first mount at level 30 instead of 40 now, and it costs a little bit less to do so. So if you're leveling a new character, remember to hop by your mount trainer at level 30 to get your new mount. 
And then once you get to level 70, you can buy your first flying mount. One thing to note is that the base flying mount, the blue one, only goes at 60% speed. This means that in general, if you're going in a straight line, using your ground mount is faster than using your flying mount. But you should still get the 60% flying mount as it unlocks a lot of content for you, like inaccessible farming spots and also all the dungeons in Netherstorm. In Shathrat City, there's a lot of interesting hidden stuff. First, you have Harris Pilton. This NPC allows you to buy the gigantic bag, which is the biggest bag in the game as of now, with 22 inventory slots. This costs a whopping 1200 gold. Right near Harris Pilton, you also have Zephyr, the NPC that offers you a teleport to Caverns of Time if you're revered with Keepers of Time. This will save you a lot of traveling time between Shathrat and Tanaris, so as soon as you're revered, remember to use this NPC to get to the Caverns of Time dungeons fast. The other cool thing in Shathrat is those two NPCs outside the tavern where Harris Pilton is. The first one allows you to get daily quests on a rotation that reward you with two badges of justice for killing the last boss of a specific heroic dungeon every day. This is very useful to gear up your character fast. The other NPC nearby is this guy that gives you dailies for killing a certain amount of trash in a specific normal dungeon. Those reward you with Ethereum prison keys. You can then go to Nether Storm and use them on the Ethereum prisons for a chance to spawn either a enemy that you can kill for 250 rep with consortium or a friendly NPC that gives you 500 rep with a random TBC faction. Very useful to get your reputations up fast to get into heroic dungeons. The other thing tied to those Ethereum prisons is the hidden boss Yor, which you can spawn in Mana Tomb's Heroic. This boss is very easy to kill and gives you a badge of justice. There's a long quest chain to be able to spawn him every day, which starts at this guy in Netherstorm and Stormspire. You'll be asked among other things to open some of those prisons for a prisoner ID tag. Another bonus boss you can spawn is in Setek Holes. A lot of people know about this, it's Anzu, the Raven Lord, which drops the Raven Mount. But even if you're not after the mount, it's still very useful to spawn Anzu to get a bonus badge of justice from this dungeon. To spawn him, you need a druid in your group who has completed a specific questline, however. So keep that in mind when recruiting for Setek Holes. To go back to Shathrat, another useful vendor is this ammunition vendor. This one is the Aldor one, but you can find the same type of vendor in the Scryer's place. He sells arrows and bullets that you're supposed to travel all around the world to buy. But thanks to this vendor, you can buy them all in here in Shathrat. This guy in the future will also be selling more ammunition. For example, the Karazhan Reputation ammunition or the Scale of Sands ammunition. The Biss ammo that you can buy right in Shathrat without needing to go around the world to restock. Talk. Another useful vendor is this guy in either Honorhold or Thralmar. He sells you very basic green gems, but those come in handy if you're leveling and you get a piece of gear that has a socket slot on it and you know you'll be replacing it soon eventually. So if you don't want to spend a lot of gold on an expensive gem, you can go here and buy these basic green gems to unlock the socket bonus and also get some more stats on the way. Finally, in Shathrat you have Garas, the Badge of Justice vendor. Early on in the game, he will not sell Primal Nether, which is a very valuable reagent for crafting professions, but probably in Phase 2 or 3, you'll be able to buy it from him with Badges of Justice, and use those to craft tradable items that you can then sell on the auction house. And then, later on, probably in Phase 4 or 5, you'll even be able to sell the Primal Nethers directly on the auction house. So if you have Badges of Justice catching dust, you can make use of them by buying Primal nethers in the future. That's an incentive to always farm badges of justice. Weapon skill is still a thing in TBC, but thankfully there's a couple new AFK methods to level it up. The best method is still the ghosts around the Diramol North dungeon arena at the last boss. But if you don't want to bother doing Diramol North, you can go to Netherstorm at Dr. Boom. This guy has essentially infinite HP. You need to be careful not to get blown up, but once you find the right angle, you can just AFK level your weapon skill here. And then the other method that I personally found is near the Black Temple. You can find the banished pit lord. If you kill the NPCs around him, he will still stay banished and you can just hit him forever and level your weapon skill that way. Summoning stones are now a thing in TBC. 
you will find those near any dungeon or raid entrance and you can use them to summon your friends to the dungeon you'll be running. No more waiting for hours for people to start moving to dungeons. There's also the warlock ritual of summoning but Blizzard said that this will not work inside dungeons. They haven't said that it will eventually but let's hope it will and then you'll even be able to summon people directly inside dungeons. If you want to get back to your Hearthstone location and your Hearthstone is on cooldown, you can use what's called Ghetto Hearting. Simply ask anyone to invite you to a group, enter a dungeon, then leave the group and you'll then be teleported to your Hearthstone location after one minute. Incidentally, the best place to use this is in Stormwind or Orgrimmar. You'll be going there quite often as there's portals in Shathrat to capital cities, but there's no portal back. So if your Hearthstone is on cooldown, you'll have no way to go back. You can then go to Stockades or Ragefire Chasm and then use Ghetto Hearting to quickly get back to Shathrat. An old but very useful trick. While riding your ground mount, you're prone to dazing, which will dismount you and reduce your movement speed by 50%. Dazing happens if you get hit by a mob from behind. Each hit you receive from behind has a 50% chance to dismount you. To avoid that, remember to always face the mobs you go through while being mounted. You can do that by using your strafe keys, or even better, by jumping and turning your mouse towards the mob. That way you'll never get dazed again. Another old but useful trick is targeting macros. Whether you're waiting for a contested mob to respawn or looking for where a mob is hiding among a bunch of other mobs, you can use targeting macros to target the closest enemy that matches the mob's name that you're searching for. You can then go ahead and mark him with a raid marker to make it even easier to find the mob you're after. This even works through walls. Very powerful and useful macro at any stage of the game. While leveling, you'll often be asked to collect some items by clicking on them on the ground. Because your character ignores the laws of physics, you can actually get those types of items even through walls given you have an angle to click on them. One quest that I noticed you can do that on while leveling is one in Terracar Forest, where you have to click those balls on the ground around those withered drain eye. Because the mobs are inside those huts, you can easily click the quest item by placing your camera angle correctly and quickly complete this quest very easily but I bet there's a lot of these types of quests all around the world, so keep that in mind while leveling. If you're an enchanter, a very useful add-on to have is Trade Skill Master. TSM is an add-on filled with very useful features, but one that I end up using the most is the disenchanting value for items. Thanks to this, you can easily see what the item is worth if you were to disenchant it, versus if you were to vendor it, versus if you were to directly sell it on the auction house. Thanks to this, you can easily make a decision on whether you should disenchant, vendor, or sell a piece of green or blue gear you receive randomly around the world. If you're an engineer on the other hand, there's a very handy way to make a lot of gold. While traveling around the world, you'll notice these gas clouds. You can find them in Zangar, Nagrand, Shadowmoon Valley, and Netherstorm. If you craft the item called Zapthrolo Moat Extractor, you'll be able to get a lot of moats from these clouds, which you can then turn into primals, and primals are probably among the most valuable reagents in TBC. Then, if you pair your moat extractor with a pair of engineering goggles, you'll be able to see these clouds on your minimap, so you can just fly around on your flying mount, look out for those clouds and extract modes from them, and make a lot of gold that way. Another good way to farm gold is the Black Morass Dungeon. You'll find these non-elite crocolisks, jaguars and spiders in here that you can kill for a bunch of valuable items to sell on the auction house. What makes this spot so good is that it's inside a dungeon, so you don't need to compete with anyone, but keep in mind that this is more for classes who can AoE, like mages or prot paladins. If you don't have any AoE capabilities, you'll probably struggle to make a good amount of gold per hour in here. Another way to make gold very easily is to complete the remaining quests that you haven't completed once you reach level 70. At 70, instead of giving you experience, the game gives you more gold from quests. So thanks to this, you can easily rake a few hundreds of golds from completing all the quests that you haven't done yet. This is a one-time thing, but you can do this on every new character you get to 70 to pay for a portion of your epic flying mount's bill on that character. 
Speaking of quests, if you want to get attuned to heroic dungeons fast, one way is to skip doing any quests in Hellfire Peninsula or Zengar Marsh. Because quests give you reputation all the way to Exalted, and normal dungeons only give you reputation up to Honored, with the exception of Shattered Halls and Steam Vaults, you can take advantage of that by farming Ramparts, Blood Furnace, Slave Pens and Underbog while leveling until you reach Honored, and then move on to Terracar Forest directly and continue leveling there. Then come back once you're 70 and do the quests in Hellfire Peninsula and Zangar to quickly get to Revered and unlock your heroic dungeon keys for those zones. To stay on the subject of questing, while leveling you'll often be faced with quests that reward you with a pre-bis item. If you're leveling a Feral Druid or Red Paladin, you'll choose the DPS reward from that quest not knowing that the quest you were doing could have given you one of your pre-raid bis items. So for this reason, I suggest you start researching your pre-raid bis gear before leveling. That way you will not fall into that trap and you won't skip powerful quest rewards for a spec that you weren't leveling with. Finally, my last tip is to pick your Karazhan Attunement quest as soon as you can. You unlock that at level 68. So as soon as you reach level 68, go to Karazhan and do the first few quests. This will allow you to get started on your Karazhan Attunement right away, and incidentally, if you happen to do the dungeon on that quest chain, you'll already have the required quest on your journal and you won't have to worry about it. And this marks the end of this video. My goal here was to provide you with as much value as possible, and I hope I accomplished that. If you learned something in this video, go ahead and give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now.